So we're going to start with um, a foundation on the, the seven churches and the book of Revelation. And then, you know, each consecutive week, um, we'll dig into each individual church and what that means um, and what, what it means for us. And so excited for the for, excited for this series. Um, we'll post on YouTube along the way. Um, and so um, take notes. Um, you can go back and watch again. Um, keep keep questions um, as well um, as we we do always. We'll um, try to open up for um, questions at the end of the series, and so we can have some we can have some time to um, to go back and ask some questions. Uh, so excited for the series and hope hope that you guys are as well. Um, so let's let's jump in. All right, um, we're gonna read um, today. We're gonna read in Revelations chapter one nine through thirteen, and this is where we're introduced to uh, really introduced to the book of Revelation um, and uh, its purpose and its true purpose. But Revelations chapter one nine through thirteen. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in, in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that was called Patmos for the word of the Lord and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, or the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and to Pergamus, and unto Thyatira, and to Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And we'll continue reading here in a, in a, in, in a bit. Um, so as I kick off this series, I want you to know that I am not a biblical scholar, um, not on anything, particularly not on the Bible and especially not in the book of Revelation. Um, that's where uh, Mike Zider comes in. So any questions about Revelation, you can, you can go to him in the, in, in the meantime. Um, there are certainly, you know, probably you guys all have a perspective on the book of Revelation that I may not have. Um, and so I, I don't want to claim to be a scholar. I don't want to claim to to know know all or do all. But I do think that um, it is worth studying and it's worth bringing out some things um, in in this study um, for the for the church. Um, and so I, I feel like I said, I've been talking with pastor. I feel like this is a, a study worth doing. Um, and so I just ask that, um, you know, we we study this together. Obviously, we're going to, you know, bring bring things to light on Wednesdays and we're going to dig into each individual church on Wednesdays. But um, do yourself a favor and do your own study. Um, cross check with me. Do some historical reading on these churches, um, because at any time that we can study um, and study to show ourselves approved. Right. So don't um, this isn't just me um teaching this just because i feel like you know we need we all need to study this all need to hear it all need to um dig in in order to um help us i believe that the book of revelation is still alive it's not dead the the bible is not dead that's why we have a scripture like second timothy 3:16 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction of righteousness so that the man of god may be perfect right um, which means to me that every book in the Bible has something for us. And I, I try not to go, um, especially on a study like this, without quoting that scripture, because if we're not careful, um, when we start reading, uh, especially in Revelation, there's a lot of ways to, to dissect it. There's a lot of ways to interpret it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what we do know is there is something in the book of Revelation for us today that we can glean in order to be made perfect. And again, it's, we are being made perfect. We won't be made, we won't be perfect until we cross the finish line before we cross into uh, eternity. Um, as we, so as we read revelation, as we study revelation, we have to know that it was not only written by the unction of the Holy ghost, um, but it is alive. 
because of the presence of God that is in, that resides in each and every one of us and resides in the pages of our Bibles. Um, it's given to us to lead, to guide, to mold us, to be made perfect. Um, and so that is an ongoing thing. And so that's why we have to study it. That's why we have to know it and, and learn to take and glean from it the things that will help us um, in our walk with God. There's three ways that you can interpret scripture. So as we um, as we're reading through Revelation, as we're studying these seven churches, there's three different ways that you can interpret scripture. First, there's a contemporary application. This is to say that the book was written and personally addressed to each specific church at that time. So that's why he John can write to the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergasus, Laodicea, uh, on and on. Um, each church had a specific location. They met at a particular time. They were living people. They were working um, for a living. They they each um, had lives, um, and they but they were all part of those local churches. Um, during this age, you could go and you could fellowship at that at each church. So it is a specific time, a specific place. Um, and so you can read um, in Revelation about um, the apostolic church that was in Ephesus, um, and you can say what John was writing was specifically to that church, and you would be correct. At the time when he says church, there was no other um, church other than the apostolic church. This was before the Catholic church was um, created. This was before um, any of the denominations split from the Catholic Church. There was only one church. And so when he says, I'm writing to the church of Ephesus and Laodicea, he is talking about a singular church at, a, at the specific locations in these different um, regions and areas. And so when you're talking about a contemporary application, that's where we can look at the history, the politics, the um, the beliefs of that region at that time, and we're taking a contemporary application of the Bible for that particular church. But then as you go deeper into application, there's also a composite application. Um, each one of these churches is a revealing picture to each church that is addressed. So um, there is a spiritual, deeper application um, that can be gleaned from what Paul or what, what John is saying to that particular church. Um, the, the book of Revelation has something to say to all churches in all ages. Each individual church and each individual who is seeking God can be spoken to by Revelation because we are a part of the composite of the church. Um, and the church in Ephesus and the church of Laodicea, they were all part of the church. And so we can take a composite application of reading scripture and we can still glean something because it was written to the church um, of that age, but also to the age that we're in right now. So it's not only to the church in Ephesus, it's not only to the church of Laodicea, but it's also to Westchester Church in 2024. It's also to um, the church in the United States in 2024. It's to the global church in the United States uh, or the global church um, in 2024, because we are all a part of the church because we are all filled with this spirit. And we'll talk about that more um, here in a bit. Um, the power um, the power of these of the, this revelation that John had for these churches and um, is never will never expire as long as the church um, of God is living and breathing and moving and working um, in the present day. Um, the church will continue to be the church until God removes the church from this earth, and we know that to be the rapture. Um, so um, that is a composite application um, that we can take. We can also take, and this is an interesting one, um, we can take a chronological application. And so as we um, as we study this, we, we start seeing that um, there is an order in which John writes and speaks to the seven churches. From Pentecost to the catching away, it's all here. 
Um, and, you know, when you read in what in, in chapter one, and then when you start digging into these these different specific letters that he's writing to these churches, it's always in the same order. And that isn't by accident. Um, and so we can take a chronological application and look at why does the order matter? What is the differences between the church? What are the differences in what they're going through, what they're dealing with? Um, what what John is seeing in the spirit and how he's trying to guide them and lead them. What does that mean for us in the church age that we are in right now? So from Pentecost to the rapture, um, we can see um, the we can see the the span and the evolution of the church, just like we can see a, the span and evolution of us as individuals in these letters. And so there's something to glean as we study this. Only God, an all-seeing, all-knowing God, who is, spans the past, the present, and the future, which is why I believe that John starts this with saying the Alpha, the Omega, the first, and the last, because it's important to know that in, when we're reading these and studying these churches, the one that is writing it has a viewpoint from the beginning to the end. And that's not just the beginning to when John is writing the letters, that's to the beginning until the church is raptured. And so um, we can take we can take what um, John is writing, what John is seeing, and what John is um, revealing about the church and about the end times. Um, we can take that and we can apply it to our lives because the author of this thing is all knowing. The author of this thing sees us where we are right now. He sees where we're going to be in uh, five years. He saw um, where they were um, in uh, when uh, when they were being martyred, when they were being persecuted. He saw where they were before Jesus came. He saw um, where they were at the very beginning. Right? He has everything. Um, he knows everything. And so when we when we're studying and we're reading, we can also be confident in the application of what he, John saw into our lives because we know who the author was. It was not John. It was God. And God sees everything. Amen. So um, with that, there's a lot to know about um, that we could we could dive in right now in the book of Ephesus. Um, but I wanted to just take um take tonight and do some foundational study on the context of um, the writer, context of um, where he was writing it, um, because that matters, right? Like it matters where, um, you know, the the moment in time that John um, is um, at in John in Revelation chapter one. So let's let's talk about the writer, the Apostle John. Um, and he's not just the Apostle John. We also know him as John the Beloved. Um, he was one that Jesus shared something very special with. Um, there are friendships and then there are close friendships. We we know that to be the case, right? There are people that we're friends with on Instagram. And then there's people that we'll invite over um, for our kid's birthday party. And there's kids that we, and there's people that we would go on vacation with, right? There is a very clear line between those people, Um John was in the inner circle of Jesus, um, the sons of thunder, right? Peter, James, and John. John was the younger brother of James, and history tells us that he was the youngest of the 12 disciples. There was a remarkable friendship and closeness between John and, and the Lord. A couple of descriptions have made of, of, of John, um, you know, being the one that sat next to Jesus at meals and leaning against him. And at the time um, when they ate on the ground. And so like you, at the end of, at the end of dinner, um, you would, you would sit back and you would just relax and you would lean against um, your friends. You'd lean against, you know, your, the people next to you. And so what this is saying, whenever it talks about that, John, you know, leans against Jesus, what it's talking about is um, they were, they were close. They were comfortable. They were, they were friends. It was beyond, uh, it was, yes, it was a um, rabbi um, student um, relationship, but there was a friendship, a close friendship between John and Jesus. Um, on the cross, we know that Jesus commends the care of his mother to John. John, the Bible says, immediately takes Jesus' mother, Mary, to his home from that day forward. 
that is not just something that you throw out to someone that you're not comfortable with, to someone that you're not close with. We know that John uh, refused to recant or back down on his faith. There are several historical stories. Uh, if you read up on John, um, of John and the different disciples and their different persecutions, all of their deaths. Um, but John was a spectacular believer in the gospel. John had aged most likely the um, the last living apostle. Uh, apostle. Um, he was the bishop over the churches of Asia, which is why he had the authority to, to write them and really put them on blast. Um, he was he was their bishop. He was their teacher. He was the last one um, to uh, uh, the last one, the last apostle living. Um, the, la the seven churches that are listed in the first chapter of Revelation are the regional churches. Um, there's probably a lot of other smaller churches, but he was the bishop over the, the seven key churches that then had daughter works, if you will, or had, um, you know, remote, uh, 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 it's the wrong word, um, uh, churches that were connected to them. And so when he's writing to the seven churches in Revelation, there are more than those seven churches, um, but he's writing to the roots, right? He's writing to the mothers um, of the churches. Um, there were... Uh, is estimated that John was 83 to 84 years old when he was banished to Patmos. And he was banished because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, and so the story behind that testimony um, is that John refused to not speak of Jesus. He refused to not preach uh, the gospel to anyone and everyone um, that he could preach to. Um, he wrote and taught to everyone that he could about this Jesus and about his gospel. John, the book of John, the gospel of John is written in John's older age um, because um, the gospel was being perverted, right? There were those that were writing false gospels. They were pretending and, and writing to be uh, things that were not canon, things that were not um, truth. And so John picks up his pen um, later on in his life, um, uh, between in his 80s, he picked up the pen in order to make sure that his leading legacy, that he, his leaving legacy was that he was going to make sure that that the account was told, that his account was told. And so he, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, wrote the Gospel of John and then also wrote the, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John um, after he um, left exile from Patmos. According to histor historical accounts um, and, Roman hist and Roman historical sites, John was called before the king of Rome, um, Caesar Prometian, and he was demanded to recant his faith. In other words, he was, he was said, you have to stop preaching about this man, Jesus. Um, but of course, John refused. And even though Prometian threatened him with boiling him alive in oil, um, John still refused to recant his faith. At this point in Roman history, um, and again, this is where like your you know your individual study, you, you'll find so much here. But um, uh, there were so many um, Christians in Rome that um, it was it was impossible to kill them all. In fact, they tried. The more that they killed, the more that the gospel spread, the more that um, the Bible tells us that um, the more they were persecuted, the, the larger the church grew. Um, and so uh, Promethean um, was going to use John as, uh, as an example, because he felt like if he could cut off the head of the snake, um, that uh, that the whole thing would end. And so he um, set a date that um, that that John was going to be um, put to death. He invited um, he invited all these leaders in, in Rome um, to come and watch. It was going to be a spectacle because um, Promethean had finally found John. He had finally uh, he was going to put to the end, an end to this Christianity thing, right? Put an end to this um, Jesus only um, doctrine that was going around in Rome. Um, and he was going to burn, boil alive um, John in a vat of oil. Um, olive oil flashes at about 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, just imagine how painful that would have to be. Um, 
And so just a little less than 290 degrees, boiling oil. Um, the crowd watched as John was lowered into the oil, expecting cries of pain. They were expecting um, agony um, and, a, and a brutal death. But history tells us that instead of that, John was unscathed. No harm was, um, was given to John. Um, he steps out of the oil and Promethean stands and demands of John, what manner of man are you? And John answers confidently, it is not me, O king, it is the God I serve, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Promethean is, is embarrassed in front of um, all in this crowd. Um, and, um, and so the only thing he can think to do is to exile John to Patmos so he can do no more harm. He can't preach the gospel to anyone else. Um, as an aside, just historically, it's interesting to me that it, it history tells us that from this day, um, Promethean um, suffered from a weak heart, um, and he and he died not too long after with what people think is a heart attack. Um, and so it's just interesting to me that um, that John outlived Promethean um, because of God's hand of protection and because of the miraculous. And so it's super it's super fascinating. Um, so because oil could not boil him um, or kill him, Caesar sentenced him to exile in Patmos. Um, and uh, along with um, John, there is another uh, character in the story that's interesting here. His name is Procurit, Procurus. Um, we only hear about him in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. He was named as deacon, as a deacon to help oversee the church business in Jerusalem. Um, church history says that as John had aged, this younger man, Procurus, um, gave his life to assist John, to help out the, the bishop, to, to minister to him, to um, serve alongside of him. And so when John received the sentence um, to banishment to the Isle of Patmos, Procurus also asked to come along with him. Um, and even though the Romans thought he was crazy because no one wanted to go to Patmos, um, he was given permission to do to do this and go with the Apostle John, who at this point is in his 80s, right? Um, and so together they arrived at Patmos to live the rest of their lives um, out on this island. Um, just raise a uh, raise of hands or in the chat. How many of you knew that John had somebody with him? Anybody know that? Because most people don't. And that's like really fascinating because you don't don't necessarily... Um, get that in uh, in church history, right? So that's that's why uh, you know it's 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 great to study. It's great to study this. Um, so John and Procurus now find themselves on Patmos. Patmos is a rocky island. Um, they had to import their drinking water. Um, it was a place um, for the misfits, a place for um, those who needed to be shut up, a place um, that uh, was not a. It was not a um, it was not a resort town. Um, it was, it was, it was rocky. It was, you couldn't grow anything. Um, food was scarce. Um, but yet here, um, on Patmos, um, is a place that God sent John to give him the greatest revelation, um, that we have in our, in our Bible. In this place where there wasn't any, there wasn't a land to grow food, um, this island was divided into two parts. One part held violent prisoners, and the other the political prisoners, like John. They were left to themselves to find their own food, make provisions for shelter. Um, and history says that on the other side of the island there is a cave, and this cave has now been made into a church because it is in this cave that John and Procurus find themselves in. Um, History tells us that there were already some Christians on Patmos that had been sent there on by Rome because they wouldn't shut up. They wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Um, and these Christians, when they saw the John the Beloved, when they saw the, their, their bishop, their apostle, they left the cave, they left the comfort, and they gave this cave to John and to Procurus. Um, it was the best place on the island, um, and it wasn't even that great, but it was the best place on the island, and it was given to John and Procurus. And it was in this cave that the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to John. Church history states that John would lay on the rocky floor 
of that cave and God would give him the visions um, to, that he would then speak aloud and Procurus would write them down. In that cave, there was um, there's a hole in the wall that still that held that would hold an inkwell and Procurus would not only take care of and wait on and serve, find food and water for John, but he would also pin the things that we call the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's evident that in Patmos, there was um, Patmos was just a stop for John. It was a um, a place um, that uh, uh, Promethean meant as uh, as doom for John, but God meant it as a place that he could he could get John by himself, so that way he could give him revelation. And not to not to get too preachy on us tonight, but. There are some times that we find ourselves in Patmos, right? We find ourselves in a place that doesn't seem right, doesn't seem fair, that we're surrounded by um, by um, conditions and by people that are not like us, and we we do not know why we are where we are. But can I just can I pose a question to us tonight, which is that maybe, just maybe, if we'll allow God to be God in our life, that He has placed us in the in the in the Patmos that we are in, not to um, not to punish us, not to um, not to make our lives miserable, but He's placed us there because this might be the only place that we are have enough silence, enough solitude, enough of, of a mindset to say, "Okay, God, I'm going to listen to you now. I'm going to get into the Spirit on on your day. I'm going to." take out all distractions because I have no other choice and I'm going to hear from you. And God is like, that's what Patmos is for. That is what I, I, I've been waiting to give the revelation to you, John, but I'm not able to do that in Rome. I'm not able to do that when you're traveling to your different, to the different churches in Asia. I'm not able, um, I'm not able to do that unless I get you to Patmos. And so why don't we just let God be God in our lives and just, sit in pat sit in patmos for as long as we need to it's not our it's not our final destination westchester church it's just a, it's just a stop on the journey but if we'll let him reveal himself to us um in in patmos he will speak to us he will reveal some things to us that will rock our world and will rock the world of those that are around us amen so that was just that's just an aside um history says that um when Procurus died, so Procurus dies on this, um, on Patmos, word got back to um, to Rome that John was there alone, and they allowed John to leave Patmos after being there for almost 15 months. <laughs> it's just interesting to me that I want, you know, I've always wondered this, did Procurus die? Because Procurus was so focused on serving the man of God and serving the work of God that did he give did he give the water the little resources that he have did he give that to john instead of himself again conjecture we don't have history to say that but um it, it's just fascinating that he was so dedicated so dedicated to the 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 things of god that he most likely put the things of God over his own health, over his own um, his own, own will, his own ability to, to say, one day I'm going to get off, off of here in order for the kingdom of God to be advanced. Um, just fascinating to me. Um, John's age is estimated at this point to be 84, 85 years old. Um, and he goes back to Ephesus after Patmos um, to live for four or five years more before dying of old age. Um, so, um, Caesar couldn't kill him. Um, oil couldn't kill him. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to determine when you go, John, and it's not going to be by martyrdom. It's not going to be by anything. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to let you live out your life um, on my, on my timing, because that's what God does, right? It's God's plan. It is truly God's plan. So now when we speak of Patmos, of John, of the visions given to him, of the writings, I wanted you to have a good picture of what we're talking about. And this is um, hopefully what we'll do throughout the study as we talk about um, about the different churches, is we'll dig into like what, what those um, churches, like the environment, the geographies of, of those churches. And so 
th those things are super fascinating to me because I feel like they all have purpose, right? Um, they all they all have a reason um, for being in there, and so studying that out is is fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> the the book of Revelations is technically the revelation of Jesus Christ. In Greek, it is apocalypsis, which means to reveal, to disclose a revelation disclosure. Um, this book is specifically a disclosure to reveal something very specific, and that is Jesus Christ. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's addressed to a specific audience, not to everybody. It's not addressed to the world. It is addressed to the seven churches in Asia. Now, Again, we've talked about this. This there's not just, um, you know, it can be interpreted of um, the actual physical churches of that time and those churches connected to them at that specific point in time, but we can also glean from that um, and understand what it means to be the church and to, to pick up from this. Each church is given accolades, given warnings, given rep reprimands. Um, and it should comfort each of us because there is no perfect church here on earth, right? The only perfect church will be the one that exists around the throne. Um, and so um, at Westchester Church, we're trying to build a perfect church, um, but we will never be perfect. Um, someone once said, um, if you're looking for a perfect church, um, and if a perfect church would exist, it would, it would cease to be perfect the moment that you or I walk through the door because none of us are perfect right? None of us are perfect. And none of the churches in that is being addressed in John's revelation of Jesus Christ are perfect either. Not only do these churches represent actual physical real churches in that hour, um, but 2,000 years later, um, they represent spiritual congregations in us. A church was just a body of believers believing the doctrine of the apostles. That's why when we say that we're apostolic, um, we we are identifying ourselves with the same churches that Paul is writing these letters to. And how can we, how can we say that is because we pull our doctrine. We pull what we teach from the doctrine of the apostles, right? What was preached in the book of Acts, we preach today. What Jesus preached and taught the apostles that was preached in the book of Acts we preach today. We pull that from the word of God. And so that's why whenever John says that I'm writing these letters to the seven churches, I'm addressing these letters to the seven churches. That's why we can confidently say that he is also writing these letters to the church in Westchester in White Plains, New York. He's writing this church to the New York Metro. He's uh, writing this church to a church that's uh, to an apostolic church that's in Minnesota or a church that's in Timbuktu. If you, they are filled with the spirit, if they are, have the Holy Ghost, if they are preaching the apostles doctrine, then we can pull from uh, John's letters. Um, we can glean from that because we are also filled with his spirit. Um, seven churches. Um, and as we read in uh, Acts, uh, in Acts, in Revelation 1, um, it's seven churches, and he also says into the seven spirits. Each church had a spirit that was before the throne. The word spirit is the same word that's used in Genesis when man was created in the garden. Um, it's the Hebrew word ruach, which means wind, semblance of breath. It is what was used to turn Adam into a living soul. Um, it's also the same word that was used for what happened on the day of Pentecost, that wind that filled the upper room, the spirit that filled all of those on that day. It was ruach. It was um, uh, in Greek, pneuma, it's the same word. And we know um, that the Bible says that there is one spirit, one baptism, right? We're not, we're not splitting hairs there. It's one spirit, one baptism. And this is the same word that, um, that is used for Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, 4. So when when it talks about that they're um, that he's speaking to the spirit of the, these different churches, um, he's speaking to the the spirit that's moving within them. He's talking about um, that uh, when he says, "In the last days, I will pour out my spirit." So that's why we can pull and glean from Revelation because we can identify with that spirit. And at the risk of sounding uh, exclusive. Um, 
I just want to clarify something that as that's super imperative as we continue this study um, is that he is teaching and preaching to these regional churches that were the church. It was the church. They were the only ones that were preaching the apostles doctrine. These seven churches, those churches alone, they had, they had the Ruach. They had the Numa. They had the Holy Ghost. They had the Spirit of God inside of them, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Any group, any church, any congregation that was not teaching or preaching the apostles' doctrine, these letters, the revelation of Jesus Christ, would not be applicable to them because they were not following the apostles' doctrine. And I know that sounds exclusive. And I'm not saying that um, I am not saying that what I, Nathan King, am saying right now is um, is exclusive. I'm saying that the Bible is is teaches and preaches that the Holy Ghost is a requirement. The Spirit of God is a requirement, and that re the revelation of Jesus Christ was lit was written for a church plural, or a singular, of these seven regions, because they all had the same spirit living and abiding with them. It was specifically written to those churches that was filled with his spirit. And churches that do not preach or believe in the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, not sorry, they're not churches, they're gatherings. Because in order for you to be a church, go back to what, when Jesus established the church with with Peter. Peter said what he acknowledged who Jesus was, that thou that you're God, you're the Christ. And Jesus says, it is on this revelation of who I am that I'm going to build my church. And so um, there are there are so many people that gather and they claim to be a church, but they have removed a revelation of who Jesus is. They've removed any responsibility to live a life um, that is separate. Um, that Jesus that Jesus taught. They removed uh, the requirement to be um, holy as he is holy. Um, and they removed the things that make them, that properly qualified them to be a church. And so as we study this in Revelation, it's so important that we make sure that we as, as individuals and we as a church, if we are going to pull something out of this to, to live our life, if we're going to glean anything out of this, we need to make sure that we're identified with the church that God has built. Amen. I'm almost done. Seven churches are written in, in, in a specific order. We've kind of talked about that. It's the order that we're going to study them in this in this series. Um, they're written in the same order um, a couple of times in Revelation. And so the order uh, matters. Um it's uh, the same order twice in the first chapter, and then as as John is is writing specifically to each individual church, he keeps that same order. Um, and so I believe that as we develop spiritually, we are traveling through these seven churches, um, and we'll again we'll we'll dive into that as we do as we study them deeper. But in any given point, in any given time, we can have the good or the bad operating in us spiritually. Um, and we see that in these different churches. Um, there are those that believe that these are just ages and periods of time. And again, if you take a, um, a composite view of that, a chronological view of that, um, that is, you know, you, you can pull that, you can extract that. Because um, some people think that um, it's just ages, these periods of time um, that we are, that we right now are in the Laodicean church age. Um, but I, you know, again, I think it's an interesting point of study and we'll talk about that as we, as we dig in. Um, but I, I think that it's, I think it's deeper than that. I think that we can, as an individual, we can, we can identify with these different seasons and these different um, pieces of these individual churches. Um, because, uh, Laodicea was, was called out for being lukewarm, but we don't have to be lukewarm ever. Um, but yet we go through seasons of being lukewarm, right? Um, and so we can pull out from um, Scripture on what do we need to do to be on fire for God? Not hot or not cold, um, not lukewarm, but on fire for God. 
Um, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into what that means both chronologically um, for the church ages, but also what that means for us individually as well. So here's the seven orders and their names, um, what they mean, and then we're gonna study them um, in this order in the coming weeks. Ephesus means desirable. Smyrna means myrrh. Pergamus means the citadel, height, elevation. Um, Thyatira um, is the castle of Thyatira. Sardis, the prince of joy. Philadelphia, loyal, brotherly love. And Laodicea, justice of the people. <laughs> that means nothing to you right now. I, you know, we'll we'll dig into that. But um, all of these are are super fascinating as we dig into why these names matter. Um, to consider them in these churches is to come face to face with the Bible's most fascinating anomalies and contradictions. There were seven churches, and not only the first church and the first church age, but they are perhaps representative of every generation of the church mirrored in them. Um, and in the midst of these writings, John content, God, John, God, through John, continually says, I have somewhat ought against thee. What does that mean? It means that they're, each of them did something wrong. And in all of these writings were uh, connected to, let him that has an ear, let him hear, um, to what he is saying to the churches. Could it be that he is saying in this that um, there's more to this for each and every one of us than we could have imagined? These churches, they were a mixed bag, right? They, they had good and evil, they right and wrong, they were courage, they were cowardice, it was... It was a mixture of opposites. Um, and yet, um, six out of the seven churches he found something wrong with. One, he found nothing right at all. And only one, Smyrna, um, and, uh, Smyrna that he found no reason to rebuke, rebuke them. Um, and within those churches, there were people that, and we'll, again, we'll dig into that, there were people who had forgotten their first love, people that had cooled in their desire for God becoming lukewarm, people who were false in their profession of righteousness, workers of iniquity. Um, there were some who had true faith and some who had false faith um, and some who had no faith at all. There were those who were devout, dedicated unto the death, and then there were those whose hearts were filled um, with the world and, um, and there were tares among the wheat. Among the children of light, there were children of darkness. Without exception, there were within all of these this strange mixture of the good and the bad, um, the, um, the, the nice and the ugly, right? Um, there was this mingling of all of this. And some may think that these first churches, since they were founded um, by the apostles themselves, we think of them as pillars of purity, right? You think about the, the church in uh, Corinthians. We talk about um, the, the churches, um, these seven churches, as, as foundational churches for us to emulate. But they had their weaknesses. They had their, their shortcomings. Um, they, were, they were dealing with false doctrine. They were, feel, they were dealing with um, thing with outside um, things coming into their church. They, like us, had to deal with the flesh and the carnality. They were a mixture of good and evil. But um, when we look at this, um, <laughs> there's a fascinating, when we look at Revelations 1, 13 through 18, so this is the verses after what we read at the beginning. Um, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps of the golden can girdle. His head and his hairs were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass as they turned in a furnace, and his voice as of the sound of many waters. And he had his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was the sun shineth in strength. Um and when, he, when I saw him and I fell at his feet as dead, and I laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, um, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and he that was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Those seven churches, they were a mixed bag. They have, um, and we'll, we'll study this. They had good and they had bad. They had, they had ugly. But at the end of the day, guess what? Jesus was right in the middle of them, and he was watching and he was working, and he was there with them, um, just like he is with us today, and just like he's working in our church. Our church is not perfect. Our church will never be perfect. But we have, we are, we are dedicated to making sure that every time we come together, that Jesus is in our midst. And the exciting thing about um, about studying this 
is we now have examples of what to be and we have examples of what not to be. And so how will we take these seven churches in Revelation and how will we apply it to our church and how will we apply it to our personal walks with God? And I, and I just encourage each and every one of you as we're studying this um, to open up your hearts and your minds and your spirits and allow him to move um, and teach and speak to us. And don't be so callous to think that um, what John was revealing in the book of Revelation was just to the church in Ephesus, was just to the church in Smyrna, just to the church in Laodicea. He was writing to us, um, writing for our benefit writing for our reproof, writing for our instruction, so that the man of God, the woman of God, the young person of God can be made perfect. Um, and we are constantly striving for that. Amen. So next week, we will dig into Ephesus. Um, and I'm excited. I uh, I think we'll, uh, uh, I, I hope that you guys will, will enjoy this series with us. Amen. All right. Amen. Okay, let's uh